So welcome everyone. Um, today's uh, speaker is uh, Sergei Potelnikov. He's a candidate for the QBI Fellow Program. That's um, one of the fellow programs we have at UCSF, um, where you get your salary. It's a little higher than a postdoc salary and you get some money for research, maybe for um, uh, research personnel, maybe for uh, computing in Sergey's case or experimentation. And I think it's like three years perhaps, uh, or meant to be for three years. It's a very nice position to go into uh, out of your PhD uh, and maybe accelerate your um, progress towards an independent faculty uh, tenure track position in a very nice environment. Um, saying it self-confidently. Um, there's also a Sandler program in addition to the QBI program at UCSF, as you may know. So Sergey is here uh, for this purpose, to see the place, talk to people, uh, give a seminar. Um, uh, I met him, I think, in person for the first time earlier this year um, at uh, the Laufer Center at Stony Brook, where he had a uh, very exciting poster that he presented in a very exciting and insightful way. I really enjoyed that. Um, but more formally, uh, he received his bachelor's and master's degree degrees in applied mathematics and physics from the Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology. Um, that probably is the premier institution in Russia for these sort of things. So we should appreciate that. Uh, he is currently a PhD student uh, with Dima Kozakov at Laufer Center, as I mentioned, um, for physical and quantitative biology at Stony Brook University. And that center until recently was directed by a UCSF alumni, Ken Dill. Uh, he was, Ken was a professor at UCSF, a founding member of the computation biology effort at UCSF for many years until about 2008 or so uh, when he moved to Stony Brook. Um, but, but Sergey has been working on methods for structural modeling of protein-protein and protein-small molecule interactions, including uh, an interesting type of protein, inter uh, protein complexes, uh, namely PRODEC uh, ternary complexes that, that are important in drug discovery, as you probably know. And um, with these methods in hand that he developed or helped develop, he su very successfully uh, participated in energetically, if I may say so, in uh, a number of community-wide, um, he called them competitions, but I don't like that. <laughs> uh, exercises, benchmarking experiments, ex experiments uh, of computational methods against um, uh, uh, against um, uh, experimental data not known at the time the predictions are made, including uh, CAPRI, GPCR, DOC, CASP, D3R, uh, brain challenges. Uh, so he developed uh, a, a number of class pro web servers. He's working on fragment-based virtual screening pro protocols, active variant neural networks, methods for modeling large protein systems, and also liquid-liquid phase separations, and he'll narrow his talk <laughs> to a subset of these topics, uh, but I hope you get a little bit of an impression about uh, the breadth of his interests. Um, thank you, Sergey, for being here. Looking forward to your presentation. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so today I would like to talk about efficient methods, efficient computational methods for structural modeling. And efficiency is one of the aspects that is very important because uh, it allows us to take advantage of existing computational resources. It allows us to get the results much faster and also to reach scales that are otherwise inaccessible. Uh, and that I, I will present uh, three methods that I have been working on. Actually, these three methods are spanning the, the uh, spectrum ranging from the protein small molecule interactions on the left hand side to protein protein uh, interactions on the right hand side and something that is sort of in between that requires modeling both protein protein interactions and protein small molecule interactions that is uh, 
uh, protag system, protag is targeting chimera system. Um, so um, let me start. I will begin with our efforts in uh, protein small molecule uh, docking development. So uh, historically, we have been participating in developing protein protein interaction uh, methods that uh, the, that's called class pro. And we have been participating in Capri experiments, uh, community-wide experiments pretty successfully. But we were always interested in developing something for protein ligand interaction. And uh, at some point, we started participating in uh, community-wide uh, experiments uh, like uh, CASP, GPCR, DOC, and T3R. And we developed a template-based uh, uh, protein ligand docking. So it's a uh, method that relies on already known structures on uh, where there is an interaction between relevant protein and protein and ligand. And so by relevancy, by similarity, I mean, um, for ligands, it's a maximal common substructure. Uh, it's essentially a graph algorithm that calculates the maximal subgraph between two molecular graphs. And for protein similarity, we use HHT, which is a hidden Markov model uh, similarity homology detection tool. Um, we also combine it with optimization that we did, uh, we used before all atom optimization and also something like uh, manifold optimization when the molecule is represented, the degrees of, mo the degrees of molecules that we use uh, only torsions and rotation and translation. Um, we participated in, a, as I mentioned, in a cup in a several uh, competitions, including uh, uh, two recent DTR grand challenges where we have been uh, top performers, top performers, and also recently we participated in CASP, of course, ligand uh, prediction uh, category, and also GPCR dog competitions. And so, yeah, um, the DTR challenge was especially uh, also I would like to highlight the DTR challenge was especially challenging because the ligands uh, that we were asked to predict were macrocycles, and for macrocycles it's really hard to model uh, conformational space. You need always to close the loop. We also combine this method together with mass spec uh, to perform large scale mapping of native protein metabolite interactions in E. coli. Uh, that work was done in collaboration with Andrew Emili. So Andrew Emili is a, a big specialist in mass spec and protein protein interactions. So we have been working with him on protein protein interactions before, but recently he became very interested in also capturing protein native protein metabolite interactions uh, for example, in this case, in E. coli. And he developed a ligand purification uh, mass spectrometry approach that can measure uh, mass of the metabolite co-purified with the bait protein. And of course, there is an ambiguity because we know the mass, but we know, don't know what is the specific ligand, what is the specific metabolite binding to the protein. And so this ambiguity was uh, addressed by LIC-TBM. So we modeled all potential uh, metabolites from the database that corresponds to a certain mass with the protein and thus help to identify which metabolite is actually binding to the protein. There is a second ambiguity uh, that is uh, sometimes what might happen is the bait protein might interact with the other protein and the second protein is actually interacting with the ligand. So there is no direct interaction between ligand metabolite and bait protein. It's breached via an intermediate protein and so we also modeled that using known protein protein interaction data and also generated by Andrew, uh, Andrew's group. So with that, we identified uh, 476 uh, protein metabolite interactions for uh, 163 proteins, 92 uh, essential enzymes and 75 tra essential transcription factors. So here you can see some of them, some of them are known, but, so, but most of them are novel. And we, are, we, we have a structural information for them. Uh, modeled by Leak TBM. We are currently uh, doing SPR validation. On, on, on the right hand side, you can see the results. Uh, for some of them, uh, we're also trying to synthesize a synthetic analogs of those metabolites. It's our sort of an attempt to do a drug discovery, antimicrobial drug discovery. And we're also uh, currently testing them. Actually, some of these are synthesized uh, uh, synthetic, synthetic analog of metabolites. So that drug discovery exercise sort of forced us to ask whether we can use uh, TBM for screening. 
And unfortunately, no, because it relies on PDB templates. So PDB templates might be okay. They cover to a certain degree metabolites and synthetic analogs of metabolites, but certainly they don't cover chemical space. And something like a recent generation of uh, virtual screening libraries, uh, for example, and I mean real, billion scale, and I mean real. Um, but fortunately, there was a recent development in X-ray crystallography. Uh, it's uh, X-ray fragment screening. A, it relies, so the, the essence of this technology is that one can soak a protein crystal of interest with a solution of diverse um, chemical fragments, chemically diverse fragments, and resolve their complex structure. And there, that is a really useful structural information. Here you can see an example of X-ray fragment soaking done for SARS-CoV main protease. It's a very important pro protein for the virus. Uh, the host translates pro viral protein as a single long chain, multi-protein long chain. So it should be sliced into individual proteins by this main protease. So inhibiting uh, main protease might be one of the uh, strategies to, uh, to uh, attack virus. Uh, here is the zoom in of the active site. Uh, of the MPRO main protease, uh, you can see um, non-covalent fragments. And so, yeah, so we decided to use it as a template information, some kind of a template structural information for our uh, screening pipeline. We also were interested in screening for the other reason, because we have been developing, uh, our group has been developing some kind of an analog computation and analog of uh, computational uh, soaking of sorting, it's a computational uh, computational sorting which uh, identifies hotspots and dragability of binding pockets uh, called FTMAP. What it does is essentially takes the target protein and docks multiple uh, chemically diverse small uh, molecular probes to the protein, and then it cross clusters the results. Thus, essentially, what it does, it identifies sites of the pocket that binds diverse chemistry. Those are called hotspots and they have been actually empirically uh, shown to uh, frequently contribute, uh, significant, significantly contribute to the protein uh, ligand affinity. So it would be very beneficial to combine these uh, two sources of information. Unfortunately, uh, fragments, uh, soaking fragments on the left-hand side individually are not very reliable. They are usually low affinity uh, compounds. So, but perhaps together, uh, these fragments can give us some kind of a consensus signal. For example, uh, functional groups, uh, for example, functional groups that are binding, uh, to, the same binding uh, to the same binding side. And so what we did, we sliced each fragment into functional groups. We structurally clustered them. And we also overlap them with FTMAP because again, we want them to be in the hotspots. We want them to contribute significantly to the binding affinity. Uh, yeah, but I will also like to mention that FTMAP uh, highlights only a specific portion of the proteins. It doesn't cover like the whole, it doesn't cover the whole pocket. It highlights only specific regions, like for example, here it's this region and three smaller one here and here. So it's not the whole, pro it's not the whole protein pocket. So, the result of this clustering and overlapping with FTMAP, you can see on the right hand side, it's essentially some kind of a 3D pharmacophore. We already, here we already fused some of the clusters. For example, there, there is a very strong cluster of <clears throat> aromatic six, six member rings that we fuse together with uh, nitrogen, forming a hydrogen bond with protein. There is a strong cluster of carbonyl and more scattered uh, cluster of either five or six member aromatic rings. That can be also uh, fused. It can be also fused with the cluster of halide. So, doing 3D pharmacophore based screening is expensive, computationally expensive. You won't need to embed every molecule uh, in 3D. So that's why we projected this pharmacophore onto a graph representation. On the left hand side, you can see the graph representation uh, of the 3D pharmacophore. We are so we don't really need a really big compound, so we limited the number of rotatable bonds to six. And there is also a requirement that different uh, functional groups should be connected between each other. So that sort of a uh, trans that sort of translates to the shortest path uh, graph path uh, criteria. 
using this, uh, these two filters, um, complementary filters, one graph and the other one 3D pharmacophore filtering, we reduced 1 billion uh, enamine library with a graph filtering, we reduced it to 5 million. And with 3D pharmacophore filtering, we reduced it even further to around 1,000 predicted ligands that we manually inspected and ordered around 300 compounds for experimental testing. So among those, we identified 28 low micromolar hits. Um, among them, uh, two compounds were submicromolar, they are nanomolar scale. Uh, so here you can actually see the result. It's a fluorescence, fluorescence resonance energy transfer assay. Uh, it's a top hit. Uh, uh, the IC50 is somewhere around between 160 to 200 nanomoles. It's currently undergoing X-ray crystallography confirmation at the diamond light source facility by Frank van Del Group. And uh, yeah, and again, I would like to highlight it's a non-covalent inhibitor discovery and non-medicinal chemistry optimization hasn't been done. It was one shot screening uh, a project, virtual screening project. As for the future directions uh, of this, uh, of this future directions of these projects, we would also like to apply uh, combined mass spec LUCDM platform to other organisms, maybe some, under some specific conditions to further investigate protein metabolite interactions. Uh, for screening methods, uh, we are continuously participating pretty successfully in cash challenges. It's a drug discovery competition. Uh, we are continuing to develop our um, screening protocol. We want to expand it to covalent compounds. Uh, what I also mentioned that FTMAP uses 16 molecular probes. It might, be, it might not be sufficient, so we want to expand it to 119 probes. We'd also like to boost FTMAP with equivariant neural network, as a three equivariant neural network. It's a, a type of networks that respects the symmetry and physics underlying the uh, process is essentially uh, the SO3 group, the rototranslational group essentially identifies the functional form of the neural network. And so what we want to, to use is uh, SO3 equivariant convolutional neural network and SO3 transformer that we have been working in before. Uh, we have, have some experience working before with. Uh, and finally, we also want to, to test if we can use FTMR probes uh, for the formulation of the query, because right now we rely on experimental fragments that perhaps it might be possible to use FTMAP uh, fragments uh, to, uh, to form formulate the query. The next project is about proteolysis targeting chimeras, or for short Protax. It's a uh, uh, promising, uh, new new promising therapeutic modality. Uh, you, here you can see an example of Protax. It's a molecule that consists of two ligands, two uh, small molecules on the right-hand side, on the left-hand side, interconnected by a linker. So the objective of the product is to recruit natural uh, eukaryotic ubiquitin, ubiquitin prote proteasome system to degrade, to degrade a protein of interest. So we essentially want to hijack uh, degradation system, natural degradation system of the organism. So here is the Here's uh, the workflow of this approach. So we have our product, we have a target protein, and it ligase, which is a member of ubiquitin proteasome system. So product binds target protein, and then it recruits it ligase to form a ternary complex, a complex of it ligase target protein and product. Uh, thus, it ligase together with E2 ligase can ubiquitinate target protein by reattaching ubiquitin protein to the surface lysing of the target protein. And after that, it dissociates and there might, might be many rounds of that cycle. So eventually the target protein will be polyubiquitinated and hopefully eventually degraded. Here it's, here's actually how it looks like in the real life. I mean, not real life, but the molecular viewer. Uh, so the blue protein is a target protein. The green protein is a E3 ligase uh, recognizing the main. Uh, for example, it might be Cerablon or uh, VHL. I will talk about it later. Uh, gray is E2 uh, protein enzyme. And yellow is the ubiquitin. So eventually, ubiquitin will be transferred to the target protein, hopefully, and thus marking a target protein for degradation. So 
yes, and, and we yeah, so we will if you want to aid this design, we want to aid design of products. Uh, and the problems that we would like to solve, we would like to be able to predict product ternary complex structure. It's a, again to remind you structure of target protein, protac, and E3 ligase. And also we would like to uh, predict uh, product efficiency, degradation efficiency. It's a challenging problem. It's a multi-scale uh, problem. It has a protein-protein interaction component. There is also protein-small molecule interaction. There is also this linker that is combining, that, that is connecting two, two ligands. Uh, the linker might have a non-trivial chemistry. Uh, it might, might have a very convoluted conformational space. Uh, even more than that, the proteins that are interacting here, E3 ligase and target protein, are not evolved to are not evolved to interact with each other. So it's non-native interaction between proteins. And even more than that, it might be a suboptimal interface. So it's not the best energy that one can get with docking these two these two proteins. So what we actually need, we actually need to do protein protein docking and account for protein on the fly at the same time. So, I mean, that would be the best strategy, the most efficient strategy, as I was saying, the purpose is efficiency. Um, for protein-protein docking, we have been developing uh, FFT convolution approach. And in this case, we, I would like to also apply FFT convolution approach. It enables global exhaustive protein-protein sampling. It represents each protein uh, as a grid. It projects each protein onto the grid. Uh, some properties of the protein onto the grid. And then it represents the energy as a sum of multiple terms where each term is a convolution of these two grids, receptor grid and ligand grid. And I would argue it's a pretty natural, uh, it's a pretty natural functional form for energy terms. For example, electrostatics can be naturally represented as a convolution of charge density distribution and potential created by the second protein. So, the other reason, uh, so the main reason why we, we want to use exactly this functional form is because, it, because of the efficiency. The thing is that in the Fourier space, uh, convolution becomes a dot product and we can take advantage of FFT, fast Fourier transform algorithm and reduce the complexity of the problem from six order of the grid size and N is a grid size to the cube logarithm N. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's essentially, what, en what enables global sampling with FFT. Otherwise it would be impossible or very hard. Um, we, still want to, to, we still want to have atomic resolution. So we use a very small, uh, small grid step and the number of rotations is also a pretty large 70,000 rotations, which corresponds to five uh, degrees of angular resolution. Uh, here is uh, the same idea in a little bit different representation. So we have structure of uh, one protein and the other protein. We project them onto the grids and Fourier transform them. And then we do inverse Fourier transform. So every Fourier transform, we fast Fourier transform. And eventually we are getting the landscape, prototranslational landscape of the uh, protein protein interaction. Uh, we use, uh, as a free energy model, we use uh, Van der Waals. Van der Waals can be represented as, as two convolutions. Uh, electrostatics, again, convolution. In this case, we are using Born approximation. And we also have a pair contact uh, potential, which is which can be also represented as a convolution, as a number of convolutions after eigenvalue, eigenvector decomposition. And so the question is, how do we bake, how do we bake in product here? So because eventually we want to model two proteins interacting with each other, and there is also a product which binds to the to both of them. And there is a linker connecting them. So how do we incorporate? How do we account for product? Because we want to do, uh, we want to do uh, FFT. We want to do, we want to sample protein-protein interactions and filter for product at the same time in a single FFT step. Here is the trick. Uh, again, here is our product. We cut it into two halves. So now we have a ligand plus half linker, another half linker, another ligand. Uh, yeah, here it's actually depicted here. Uh, these two atoms I should highlight, these two atoms are essentially the same atom and eventually we would like to reconnect two halves. So what we do first, we dock each half product to the, uh, to the target and to the E3 ligase. Usually we don't really need to dock because uh, 
design of products usually starts with well-known ligands, well-characterized ligands already published in PDB. So we just need to align it. Then we do sampling of each half linker in presence of a protein. So we, we account for chemistry, we account for conformational flexibility, we account for protein linker interaction on both sides of the docking, on the receptor side, on ligand side. It essentially gives us a set of all possible positions of the middle atom on one side and all possible positions of the middle atom on the other side. We project it onto the grid. We essentially will have two clouds of all possible potential locations of one middle atom on one side on the other side. And essentially what we want to have, we want to have an overlap of these two clouds. And overlap of these clouds corresponds to non-zero value of the convolution of these two clouds or these two grids. That is the trick. So now we can, uh, so now since, since there is an overlap, so there is a potential linker connecting to, uh, connecting to uh, health products, we can again reconnect it. Uh, we also check whether ubiquitin in this, uh, we also check whether ubiquitin in this uh, pose can be approached, can, can approach the target protein, can it be transferred to the target protein. For now, we are just using a very simple distance based filter. Um, we, a distance based filter is essential that E2 cysteine that is connected to ubiquitin should be not far away, not too far away from the lysine or the target protein, one of the surface lysine of the target protein. We minimize energetically the complex. We are doing clustering, ranking, and the top uh, cluster centers. The, the, those will be essentially our models for the ternary complex structure. Um, and as, as has been suggested by Bayer et al., we can also use number of acceptable models. So just all models that, that were generated by the method as a, some kind of a proxy for product relative efficiency. Again, it's a proxy. It's not a very strict uh, uh, claim. It's in a sense, it estimates an entropical penalty for restraining product because product is, is a really long molecule, very flexible. And if you restrain, you will, you will get a very huge entropical penalty. So that's, some, that's one way of uh, interpreting this proxy. So as I mentioned before, and now I will talk more explicitly, we use, um, people usually use in practice two types of E3 light gazes, E3 light -like gaze and corresponding substrate recognition domain. It's either cooling to E3 light -like gaze complex and it's the main called one Hippelindau, DHL for short, or it's cooling for a E3 light -like gaze or Cerablon or CRBN for short. On the left-hand side, you can see the whole ubiquitination complex. It's a model, it's, uh, it's built, uh, it's overlapped based on the overlapping, it's um, based, built based on overlapping parts. Uh, you can see ternary complex, target protein, E3 light -like gaze, E2 and ubiquitin. On the right-hand side, you can see target protein uh, here, uh, E3 light -like gaze in a ternary complex, and uh, E2 and ubiquitin in case of cerebellum. In case of cerebellum, I should also highlight that there might, might be many conf configurations of this ubiquitination assembly. So the, pro so the ubiquitin can be attached to the target protein from different sites. It can approach from different sites, thus it's uh, uh, less restrictive than VHL. In VHL, it can approach only from one side. So about benchmarking, uh, our benchmark includes 13 PDB product ternary complexes, not so many because not, not so many are available. That actually highlights the need for structural modeling in this area because it's, it, it, it looks like it's very hard to crystallize this kind of complexes. So I will name each uh, ternary complex. So the first, uh, the first part is the E3 ligase name VHL, then the name of the product, and then the name of the target protein. In this case, it's uh, a lot of bromo domains and SMARCA, all are prominent uh, cancer drug targets. Um, here you can see an overlap of our models, um, overlap of our models with crystal structure. Um, it's, yeah, the overlap is pretty, pretty uh, good. Uh, we can essentially reach uh, something like under two angstrom of small molecule RMSD. Uh, by small molecule RMSD, I mean 
we are only calculating RMSD for, for the ligands, not for the, not for the linker, because the linker might be very wobbly. So it, it, you know, it doesn't make sense. I mean, one would argue it doesn't make sense to calculate RMSD for this part because it can move. Um, I would also like to highlight that non-proton crystallized structures of proteins have been used. So those are not structures of proteins extracted from the complex, ternary complex. Those are separately crystallized. Proteins. I mean, it really like is a target protein. That is something that previous methods uh, have hasn't hasn't done. So, depending on the product, ternary complex might also be different. Different lengths of linker might might give us different protein protein poles, mutual poles, and we can capture that. Here is an example. The only difference between these two complexes is that here we use uh, a little bit. I think it's a little bit longer uh, product. Uh, in this case, it's a little bit shorter, and we can capture different poses of proteins that uh, we have in the ternary complexes. Now about the number of accessible poses and how it can give us some estimate of uh, degradation efficiency. In this case, we are using DC50. It's an analog of IC50. It's a 50% degradation concentration. Uh, um, so, what we see is we see a qualitative um, correspondence. So, uh, by the way, yeah, this, this series is uh, measured experimentally for serablon uh, bruton tyrosine kinase. It's an uh, immunodeficiency uh, drug target, also well known uh, drug target. Uh, but yeah, but so we see a qualitative correspondence between experimentally measured DC50 and, uh, and our calculated uh, measure, which is the bar height. Um, it's not quantitative. Uh, the reason why it's not quantitative is because we are not taking into account kinetics of degradation. I just to remind you, we are modeling ternary complex and we are also to some degree uh, accounting for ubiquitination process, but we are completely ignoring the, um, the kinetics of degradation at this point. So it's, a, it's, a, yeah, it's a, an aspect that is missed in our modeling. So that's there is a not quantitative, uh, there is a qualitative correspondence. Uh, just to clarify, INA is not available because some of the products might not even reach 50% degradation efficiency because of the hook effect. Uh, that's essentially when each product, because of the highest concentration of product, each product will bind to only one protein, not two. And this, it's a saturation problem, I mean, saturation uh, case. Another interesting example is uh, these two products, uh, 802 and um, 794. So the only difference between them is the attachment location. Otherwise, these products are identical. It's just slightly different, uh, different way of attaching a linker to the, uh, to the uh, E3 ligase uh, ligand. And yes, we can capture it. So it, there is a correspondence. Uh, the higher bar corresponds to um, 9.1 nanomolar. And INA is 794. Uh, we also tested whether we can capture some selectivity. So, for example, there is a product uh, ZXH326 that binds and degrades selectively only a very specific isoform of bromo domain, BRD4, BD1, and doesn't do that for the other isoforms. And again, qualitatively, qualitatively, we can capture that. Uh, again, the reason is the same. We're, our model is not complete. But what we can capture, I would say more, more quantitatively, is the stability of ternary complex. Because again, we are modeling ternary complex. And there we see actually some correlation, semi-quantitative correlation. Of course, there are some outliers. So we are attributing that to the fact that we are not combining energy of the linker and protein-protein interaction together. So there is still, uh, there is still a work to do. But still, there is, there is a correlation. There is a um, quantitative correlation between them. Recently, we also applied our algorithm to photo switchable products. It's a class of products that has this interesting chemistry, photosensitive chemistry. Uh, so in this case, it's uh, two aromatic rings interconnected by two nitrogens that are bound to each other with a double bond. So it might have cis or trans conformation. And in case of cis conformation, there is no ubiquitination, no degradation. In case of trans conformation, there is a degradation. And this is, 
uh, and of course, yeah, yeah, and you can get, we can get a trans uh, confirmation if we irradiate a sample by, uh, by light. Um, and so the question is whether we can, and yeah, and it's a, it's a really nice way to spatial, spatial temporally control the degradation, degra control the abundance of protein, uh, target protein uh, in a spatial temporal way. There, here is an example uh, that was developed by Andrew Tate's group from uh, ICL. Um, here's the photoswitchable photo chemistry, uh, E3 ligase ligand, promiscuous kinase inhibitor that is actually known to bind half of the kinome, but in the context of protoc, it binds to only three kinases, which is, yeah, which is again, an interesting, uh, interesting property of products that we can narrow down um, improve specificity of certain drugs. And so we did modeling for this uh, product to, to understand whether we can capture this small, uh, tiny difference in the linker. Again, this chemistry is in the linker, right? So it's, uh, it's, not, it's, it's a part of the linker. Uh, so the question is whether we can capture this small difference, whether it's cis or trans. The question is yes. I mean, the answer is yes, we can capture it. So essentially in trans confirmation, there is a huge number of models. And in case of uh, cis confirmation, small number of problems. We, and we even came up with a mechanistic description. The, pro, the, the essence is essentially that cis, conf, cis confirmation of protocol is too short. It doesn't reach to binding sites in the protein protein in the protein protein poles, and trans does. So it has it has some flexibility there and doesn't introduce a huge entropic penalty. As for the future directions, we are currently working in collaboration with Artyom Cherkasov from Prostate Cancer uh, Center in University of British Columbia to develop a protoc against androgen receptor DNA binding domain. So it's a prominent. Uh, cancer drug target in, in prostate cancer. And the problem with uh, this, uh, the problem with androgen receptor, that some variations of the androgen receptor doesn't have ligand binding domain. And usually all targets are targeting uh, ligand binding domain. And if it's only DNA binding domain, it doesn't have a huge cavity. So that's the reason why we want to develop a uh, product for, for it. We would also like to improve energetic description of protein linker and protein-protein interactions. As I mentioned, we want to combine these two. That's, um, that's still in development. We also want to use elastic networks to model dynamics of the ubiquitination complex. You might remember it's this hook. And one of the natural movements that it's this hook might, might do that does is contraction. So ubiquitin can approach the target, uh, target protein. So perhaps we can model uh, ubiquitination process much better than just the distance uh, filtering that we're using right now. I would also like to highlight a couple important um, notes about the convolution of health linker clouds. You remember it's this convolution, additional convolution that we add to model protoc. Uh, first of all, it can be used to model any other, any other types of linkers that is connecting two proteins to, to the mains, to folded uh, structures. It's not limited to products. It's essentially we can use uh, we can use any kind of linkers. It might be chemical cross-linking, might be interdomain uh, linkers, and that's essentially one way of introducing flexibility in our framework, in our FFT-based framework, which works with grids. So for that reason, the structures are not very flexible, but we can introduce this flexibility. Another very important. Uh, note is that we can actually use this convolution as an approximation of linker's partition function, because essentially convolution of these two grids is combinatorics, and we can weight it with Boltzmann factor. And if it's weighted Boltzmann factor and combinatorics, then it's essentially a partition function. It's, it's literally a partition function. And from there, we can get a free energy contribution of the linker. And we can, you can use that as well in our energetic description here. And eventually, we want to use all these tricks and some of the, some of the uh, methods that we do, that I developed in to, to apply to molecular glues. In molecular glues, there is no linker; it's just a ligand, which reinforces the binding of two proteins. So that's one way. I mean, that's uh, one direction that I would like to pursue in the future to modulate protein interactions. Uh, last topic is modeling multi-protein systems. Uh, here, we'll talk about compression and lookup approach. Compression meaning memory compression, lookup approach meaning extracting known values from the memory. So what we would like to do is we would like to model really large multi-protein systems. 
Of course, it's costly in terms of energy evaluation, especially if you want to do it with atomistic resolution, but maybe we can store and reuse FFT calculated global translational free energy landscape and use it to model, uh, use it to model multi-protein system to do energy evaluation for multi-protein system. Again, to remind you FFT convolutional approach, at the end, we are getting rototranslational energy landscape. Um, so, so what we'd like to do, we would like to store this 6D dimensional energy landscape in memory and reuse it for energy evaluation of system relatively rigid particles, relatively rigid particles. We would still like to uh, take advantage of high resolution of this energy landscape but the problem that it requires a lot of memory and it's just and it's just one energy landscape imagine if you have multiple proteins uh, multiple different types of proteins uh, and for each pair you would need to calculate this kind of uh, this kind of energy landscape the solution is compress not any compression will do we need a compression which will give us an opportunity to, to quickly uh, quickly access individual energy values, for example, something based on FFT won't work because it will essentially require us to use all FFT co coefficients because of the basis functions, nature of the basis functions of FFT, they are not local. Each basis function, each basis, basis function contribute to the energy value at each point. So instead what we are using, we are using wavelet compression. It's a very, it, it has a very prominent application to image compression, for example, JPEG 2000 format. Uh, here's an example of this kind of wavelet. It has a local, it's a localized basis function. So only a finite number of these uh, functions contributes to, the, to each individual energy value. And here's the result of the compression, uh, the energy landscape, the compressed energy landscape. I mean, they're usually pretty, pretty similar, uh, a little bit different representation in terms of RMSD and energy value. RMSD is calculated with respect to native, native conformation of the complex. And the compression rate, current compression rate is 60. But again, here we are doing compression only along the translational degrees of freedom. We still have to develop how to, we still want to do a compression along the rotational degrees of freedom and also perhaps maybe uh, internal conformational degrees of freedom that will boost even further the compression rate. So how do we use it? We pre-compute 6D interactional energy landscape for each pair of particle types. Again, we might have multiple types of particles. Uh, so here's the energy landscape. We compress it using wavelet compression. And then we reuse those energies to compute pairwise interactions between proteins in multi-protein system and just sum and just sum all the pairwise interactions as a, to get the total energy as a sum of pairwise interactions. Um, this is a compression lookup approach. The first um, task that we applied it to we did. Um, we we were trying. We were trying to model thermodynamics of protein solution about protein solution phase. Here are snapshots of NVT Monte Carlo simulations at different concentrations. It's a gamma crystalline particle, a, a protein that is participating in cataract uh, aggregation, of which is a reason of cataract. Of course, in the case of cataract, there is also an unfolding of protein. So what we're really doing here, we are modeling what's called cold, uh, cold liquid liquid phase separation for gamma crystalline, where the protein is not is folded, but is also very well measured. On the left hand side, you can see a calculation of chemical potential. We are using VDM insertion method. It's a statistical mechanics method to get an, an excessive chemical potential, and then we can add ideal part to get the overall chemical potential. So this is a thermodynamic result. And what you can see, it features a uh, very characteristic uh, shape, which indicates the phase, first order phase transition um, between dense phase and, uh, and uh, diluted phase. And so what it corresponds is essentially inside of the uh, cell, we will have uh, these droplets, high concentration of protein, uh, protein droplets. We can calculate coexistence densities, metastability densities. So we can also model metastability in this case. Um, from there, we can calculate phase diagram is just recalculating the same isotherm for multiple different temperatures. And here you can see an overlap between experiment and, and computation. The red points are uh, computation, the black dots are experiments. So there is a nice match, especially comparing with the previous result where it's significantly undershoots. The red is uh, computation and this um, 
uh, black, I guess, blue, uh, our experiment. So it significantly undershoots. We also do modeling of protein assemblies, all different kinds of protein assemblies from simple ones to something like a viral caps. It's, it's a Monte Carlo minimization algorithm. Uh, what I would like to highlight here is that we can also model, we can also account for conformational flexibility. For example, in this case, the macro cycle is modeled uh, as a flexible. It has multiple states. It has actually 20 states. So macro cycles, they are usually very restrained in conformational space. So we can account for conformational flexibility with a relatively small number of conformations. So here's, yeah, here are some videos. Um, what we also did, we also did um, systematic symmetry constraint sampling for icosahedral viral capsids. Again, different capsids uh, for different viruses, ranging from 60 particles to 120. At this point, we are using alpha fold build it subunits. Um, yeah, and uh, they are again overlap with crystal structure. The gray is crystal structure. The colored structure is the is the computational result. As for future devel development, we would like to improve energetic description of protein-protein interactions. For example, incorporating some of the macroscopic parameters like salt concentration, which might be important for liquid liquid phase separation, pH, and so on. So. Uh, I would like also to highlight that the compression lookup approach is agnostic to the energy, uh, agnostic to the to how the energy was generated. We can use FFT or we can use other methods. We can essentially run a really long long MD and calculate a potential of mean force or energy free energy landscape from there and also compress it. And this method can be also applied beyond can be also applied beyond uh, biology. As I mentioned, we also want to compress rotational degrees of freedom that will even further boost the compression rate. We will also we want to uh, compress also internal conformations because again there is some level of redundancy which can be also compressed. And we all also would like to integrate protoc-like linker modeling. As I mentioned before, it can be used to model any kind of I mean any kind of linkers, and we can also calculate free energy contribution of these linkers, which might be also useful for modeling flexible. Um, um, flexible proteins, like the mains interconnected by linker, something like antibodies, which is very important for, where uh, liquid liquid phase separation is a very important problem in uh, biotherapeutics formulation because it's, it, it frequently uh, aggregates. So we are making our tools uh, public. You can access them via web servers. Um, that's and that's it. Yeah. So I'd like to acknowledge. Uh, I would like to. Uh, uh, acknowledge uh, our group in the offer center, uh, Dima Kazakov, Nitri Padgorny, uh, and Derara for working on wavelet compression, Lyota on working on screening, Mikhail Gratov, Achille Jandal on Protox, and Andrea Rysenko again on compression. I would like to thank Ken Deal's group for collaboration in MPRO and liquid liquid phase separation, Evangelos Kutsios for working for work on uh, macrocycles. Uh, Peter Tong Slab for doing all the screens, all the screens for MPRO. Again, it was 300 compounds. Uh, I would like to uh, thank a group of Andrew Emily for the, our mutual work on protein metabolite interactions and also on proteomics and, and post translational modifications, and groups of Mohan Babu on doing all the SPR uh, experiments, uh, UEPM for doing the actual mass spec, groups at Boston University, Shandra Vajda for work on. Um, Protox and Adrian Vitti, uh, Maria Sabita on symmetries, Edward Tate on photo, phosph phosph photoswitchable Protox, uh, Alex Tropsha and Tim Wilson on uh, on screening protocol, uh, Diamond Light Source uh, group of Frank von Delft for doing for actually doing the work right now that they are crystallizing our compound, uh, and Gennady Poda from Ontario Institute for Cancer Research and University of Toronto who work on Protox. And I would like to also like to thank Enamin for uh, giving us a discount for 300 compounds. Um, funding NIH, NSF, recently we also got a grant for uh, Department of Energy, um, essentially give, uh, giving us access to the frontier, the biggest supercomputer to continue working on these problems. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Mm 
mm -hmm. order. Yeah, so yeah, that can be also accounted for, as I mentioned. So this kind of sampling can be can be done with any kind of energy uh, function. So in principle, SASA or any implicit solvent. I mean, even explicit. I'm not sure. Okay, I'm not sure about explicit solvent, but implicit solvent for sure. We can yeah, we can incorporate it here. Yes. Slide mm -hmm. So it's no measure point Um, okay, so what in principle we can do, we can try to just do protein protein docking, get all this get all the suboptimal uh, get all the suboptimal protein poses that are sort of facing two binding pockets towards each other. And for each of them we can in principle try to do some kind of an optimization for the linker, maybe that will be a way how, how we, we, we can do the design. Right. Maybe introduce a rigid linker to force Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, so it might, might, might be yeah, maybe one direction. Yeah, Dushan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder, are you familiar with molecular replacement in crystallography? Mm? So, so say it again, sorry. Are you familiar with the method of molecular replacement used in crystallography? I mean, to some extent, yeah. I mean, I'm, I, I'm not doing it myself. But... No, 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 because there, there, I mean, this, when you were mentioning the convolution of, of the Fourier transform, this is how we solve translational problem. But then for rotational, the, what is currently used as spherical harmonic series, which actually makes something similar, just in different, different space. So would be, I mean, instead of those 70,000 calculations, maybe you could kind of reduce this. We have a paper. Uh, but not, uh, aha, uh, so you didn't tell everything. Okay, but now, now comes the, the real question, what I'm uh, curious. Uh, I mean, in, in crystallography, we superimpose electron densities. And here you were mentioning that you're superimposing van der Waals and electrostatic potentials. So how do you pack them, actually? Uh, because, for example, because uh, there is, um, well, you need to get the potentials and not, not really the, the shape of the molecules. But what you were showing there, you were showing the grids of the molecules. So how, how do you deal with this? And it looks like that you are dealing with complex Fourier transform, not just, um, I mean, in order to incorporate uh, Van der Waals and electrostatic. So one wonder how you plan it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so the, your first question, yes, we do, spheric, we do use spherical harmonics uh, I can, yeah, I can, I can share with you a paper, 2016, PMAS by our group, which essentially does that. So we are using instead of instead of translational degrees of freedom and rotational degrees of freedom separately. What we are using, we are using angle of description, three angles for the ligand and two angles for the receptor, and uh, it's yeah, it's well, what essentially it gives us is a fast manifold Fourier transform. So yeah, we take it, we take, also take advantage of spherical harmonics. Your yeah, so, so your second question, again, we're not projecting just the shape. Uh, in case of, for example, electrostatics, what we are projecting, we are projecting charge distribution onto the grid and potential on one side. On the other side, potential, electrostatic potential generated by the other molecule. And it might be, uh, it might be, it might go well beyond the shape of the, of the molecule. And then we can evolve it as again, as I mentioned, as I mentioned electrostatic energy is natural convolution. And then I wonder why, do you think that you cannot compress um, um, the, the Fourier terms? Uh, Fourier term. well, well, when, you, when you were talking about compression and you said you, you actually you implemented the velvet um, uh, mm -hmm. transform. So you could do this the same, you could do the same kind of, well, let's say similar kind of compression also in the Fourier space. If you just uh, take the, the, the those terms which have higher, well, intensity i see but I, I mean we don't have any problem with fft so fft is pretty fast the major problem is when we want to reuse this fft so calculation over the fft is not a problem 
So we don't need to compress the grids. We can, it, it, it's a relatively fast process. So there is no need. No, no, no. This, this is what I was talking about. Yes, yeah, that you actually you just store a few points. You don't store the whole map, but you store just a few, few terms, mm -hmm. few, few, few uh, terms from the Fourier series. Let's say the most significant ones. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yes. Okay. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Andre is in, interfering, but. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah. No. I, I was just telling you that with Fourier transform, you could you could also say space if you just okay. store a few terms instead of uh, the whole. Okay. So you're suggesting to compress the grids right before converting them. Or, or am, am I? Well, reduce it? the number of terms which you store. Oh, okay. Well, okay. So you're suggesting to store each term individually, right? Each energy contribution individually. Ah, okay. I see. Yeah. No. Yeah. That potentially it might be. Yeah. It, we might take advantage of that. For example, we, when we optimize the energy I'll, I'll function. Come to lunch. Yeah. We still get lunch. Yeah. Um, any more questions? Thank you. One. Any question? Well, I'll, I'll ask a concluding question, so, but kind of fast. Uh, what if you had you had so many future directions that actually sounded very interesting. But if you had to pick one or at most two to actually work on with the highest priority going forward, what would they be? I guess the one that is in between this products and something in between protein ligand uh, interaction, protein protein interaction, something like protein and molecular views. Like I find it very interesting. Yeah, I would at least start with that. Maybe later, once I have a bigger lab, I will expand, but I will start with that, I think. I would start with that. Sounds, sounds good to me. Thank you very much again. Yeah, thank you.